Hello everybody and welcome to this month and I guess the beginning of this year's uh, Specify and Practice Group. I want to get started with a very topical conversation today on fenestration. With that I'll hand it over to our co-chairs Lewis Medcalf and Dave Sutt. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you very much Matt. And uh, this is Dave and I'm coming to you from southern New Jersey today and we're in a heat wave. We made it up into the 20s. Uh, this photo that we Lewis accused me of uh, planning this precisely because of the weather, but the photo I took in the in my own home. Uh, no, not really. We're looking at it uh, photo thanks to EFCO, uh, but gosh, on Monday it felt like this could have been in my house because we were down to uh, the balmy uh, plus three degrees as the high temperature for the day. So, Lewis, how did you survive this great weather? Oh. Um Pretty well. Uh, we're up to uh, 41 degrees and raining today here in in uh, Nashville, but uh, we did get down to a low of two degrees the day before yesterday when I left for work. Well, but we're getting close then. I'll I see we have a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of new folks, and and for our some of our ongoing uh, uh, attendees, I uh, you know just from time to time I. Uh, it makes me really feel uh, humble that folks would uh, go to the the uh, time and energy to uh, listen in to us. And uh, I want to say that Dave and I really respect your time, and we really appreciate your interest, and we want to learn from you too. So if you've got some comments or questions um, and ideas for uh, future sessions, um, you know, we consider this to be a discussion group and not a uh, webinar or a lecture. And so we look forward to as much participation as we can get out of you guys and gals. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. And I, I, I concur. I mean, this is, it's all about discussion, certainly not lecture. Nobody wants to listen to me for an hour, even you. <laughs> So today, anyhow, what, what we thought we would talk about is condensation on fenestration. We started with this subject really being about windows, and we broadened it a bit, uh, trying to take into account all of the glazed openings. Uh, this came up because of some research that I had to do on a particular project, and because of the multiple ways of trying to uh, measure or try to quantify condensation for the purpose of specifying performance for the uh, windows or the other fenestration openings. So we want to try to share with you some of what I learned in the, in the research and Lewis in the second half of today has gathered up a whole bunch of examples of probably what you ought not to do when you start detailing and installing some of these windows and glazed openings. So, and I think he has some, he'll have some great comments and we'll work our way through first about the background on fenestration and condensation and then follow with the details and hopefully that'll show how some of this will, will apply. Uh, David, before we begin, we, um, <clears throat> one of our listeners, John Warkley, has a question about white roofing and condensation. And that, John, that's outside the, what we're going to be discussing today. We're really just talking about window storefront and curtain wall. Right. So the, the one thing that we wanted to point out here, the overall performance of openings, you know, the thermal performance is not going to equal condensation resistance. So if you go in and buy the best U-value, the best solar heat gain coefficient, the best air leakage you can get out of fenestration, it is not necessarily going to guarantee that there's going to be no condensation. Is the, the biggest difference here is that the thermal, the what is reported for the opening is an average for the entire assembly because U value is a single number for the entire assembly. You can get a U value for the frame, you can get a U value for the glass, but when you're looking at the opening you have to take that 
average over the entire opening. The condensation resistance is something that is very detail specific and it can change depending upon where you are in the assembly. So it can change even if you're looking at the sill component of a window going from one corner to the other you could have different condensation resistance. If you think about where you might introduce some say bridges, some short circuits as I call it out on the screen, places like where you're going to anchor the window can and create some of these short circuits. And what is the window butting up against? Well and that, yeah, the perimeter of the opening also makes a big difference and it makes a, these, these anything that creates this short circuit especially in condensation is going to have a tremendous impact and you look at the the photo that we have here and some of that condensation along the frame especially where it's tight against the jam on the wall that could even be from air leaking So just going through a little bit of the thermal properties, and really thermal is weighted in the size and configuration of the window do matter because it affects the percentage of each one of these things that I'm showing here, the center of glass, the COG, edge of glass, and the frame. Most of the glazing manufacturers, when you look at U reported U values, are actually reporting center of glass values because that's the only piece that they can really control. The edge of glass value may be significantly worse than the center of glass because you have things at the edge happening like the sealants, the spacers, the center yeah. and the edge of glass is sometimes uh, uh, given as two and a half inches in from the actual edge of the of the uh, the seal in the insulating glass. Sometimes it's uh, given as four inches, but it's the outer rim of the glass, and it performs differently from the center of the glass because it's being captured by a metal frame. Right. And then the frame is the last piece. When you think about it, if we're putting the, all this glass into an aluminum frame, aluminum's a great conductor, so it'll take the heat from one side right through to the other and be the worst performing of all of these pieces. And of course, how many mullions you have affects that performance. If you've got a lot of small lights and a lot of frame uh, area, that's going to be different than if you have uh, a simple frame and very large pieces of glass. Right. And so here you see the illustration. Typical, maybe a double hung window. So you look at the perimeter is all the frame, the brown, uh, the edge of the glass, marked DOG, the full perimeter and then the center of glass. Looking at the illustration, you'd sit there and say, okay, well, center of glass is the bulk of the opening anyhow, and in this particular one with this particular proportion, that may be true. I, I went through and I looked at a couple of different sizes just to see what this does for the percentage of the opening. So this window might be a 36 by 48, and you can see the center of glass is 45, 46 percent, so it does make up the bulk of it. But it, you make a small change, looking at it as a 24 by 48, and now the frame is nearly as much as the center of glass. You change it to something maybe even a little bit smaller and the center of glass is now the smallest part of the window. So it's important to understand that even when you start doing some thermal testing and you get these reports coming back, uh, the thermal testing is based on standard sizes. 
and it's really about comparison one product to another and since architects always use standard size <laughs> standard test size window you know that you're going to get exactly what's reported but realistically I <laughs> we know we know that that never is going to happen so if you're if you're loading up a win, uh, your project with very small windows, you want to be at least aware what you're doing to the overall performance. So controlling condensation, how do you do it? Traditionally, you put air on the window. You talk to your HVAC engineer and you tell them, make sure that you have an outlet that's blowing air across that window because if you can keep the air moving on the inside, it's less likely that you're going to have condensation. You might have a lot of air exchanges. Back before we started to be concerned about the building envelope as much as we are, used to get air exchanges just because the building leaked. And if you're leaking winter air into your building, it's relatively low RH. So you don't have that huge moisture laden air and it actually helped keep condensation off the openings. So we're not doing that anymore. So today we're looking at trying to limit the air leakage into the building as much as we possibly can, reduce the air exchanges in each space unless we're going for the enhanced lead performance for increased <laughs> ventilation. <laughs> But we're trying to rely on the fenestration to make up for all of this, you know, to make up for what we're doing to the building envelope. And if you're trying to maintain a humidity inside the building, trying to resist this 30% RH at 70 degree interior design temperature, that can require pretty high performing opening. And of course, some uses uh, uh, require have uh, even higher demands. Uh, my firm does a lot of healthcare projects and the hospitals that we design, especially in the patient rooms and patient treatment areas, we design for 50 percent relative humidity. Right, and you would see that sort of thing even in museums just to preserve, help preserve yes. some of the artifacts. but. Unconditioned, I will tell you that here in Philadelphia I had an opportunity to do field investigation during the winter because of a wood floor failure. And in a residential building, because there is no uh, humidity control, that wintertime humidity in Philadelphia inside was only about 10%. That's what so, I would have guessed, 10 to 15%. So, right. So we get some pretty <laughs> wide variations. And if we're trying to maintain this comfort level, uh, we can start introducing a lot of problems. So how do we go about looking at condensation resistance? There are two test standards today, AMA 1503 and the NFRC 500. And that's Tell our folks what NFRC stands for. National Fenestration Rating Council. Did I get that right? Yes. yes. And NFRC is one that has come on the scene relatively recently. And it's one that's also required by Energy Star. So we'll get into that a little bit more. But these two standards are are not comparable. The results are not comparable. And there's no correlation from one to the other. So we need to be careful what we're trying to do and how we're specifying performance for these windows. So 1503 is all based on physical testing. So they put a mock window in a test chamber, they attach the thermal couples, they set out the test conditions, and they measure the surface temperature. And from that, they try to determine what the condensation might be. They report it as condensation resistance factor. So it's a, it's a scale. 
and and we might say that the scale means it's just an arbitrary number. It doesn't relate to, you know, there are no uh, units of measurement that are connected to it. It's it's purely an index kind of number for comparison purposes. Bingo! It's for comparison, so that you can look at one opening compared to another and say which one will perform better as far as condensation resistance. This test, the reported value is weighted for the entire assembly. The NFRC 500, the method here is computer simulation. So, and they actually look at the three different relative humidity at 30, 50, and 70. <coughs> Now, they do a physical test as part of NFRC 500, but the test is a select representative sample from the manufacturing line simply to verify that the computer simulation wasn't out of whack. So there's really no physical, um, or there's no extensive physical testing of these products. It's more a verification just to confirm the simulation is correct. And you can see this one is reports condensation resistance as opposed to condensation resistance factor. And the scale goes from 1 to 100. It, and again, that's a dimensionless abstract number that's, j again, just for comparison purposes. Right. The other, the other thing to note is it picks out the lowest of the three, looking at the frame, center of glass, and edge of glass. And they don't necessarily report which one that is. So you, you could be left guessing once you start changing uh, opening sizes as to how the performance is actually going to react. Now, who uses these two different kinds of tests, uh, David? I already it's said one, that. Huh? I already said that. Energy Star relies no, on well, NFRC. No, I meant more in terms of what kinds of products. Does the NFRC, is that more for manufactured factory glazed unit windows? Or is that, does it also apply to curtain wall and storefront? It was designed really as, my opinion, going to the manufactured units. Okay, and AMA uh, test standard was really designed, in my opinion, looking at curtain wall because that's where it actually started uh, providing the reported results. Okay. Um, we had a question from Joseph Stipka who ask which end of the scale is better performing? An excellent oh, question. And I'm sorry. It's higher is better. Higher is better. Higher is uh, better. On the CRF scale, typically you want something that's not below 50. And the higher the better. The higher the better. And both of these tests are actually reported at the same test conditions. So the premise is because they use exact same test conditions that you could potentially run both tests simultaneously if you chose to do that. I don't know what advantage that would give, but it at least lets you to be able to have that opportunity. Okay, the reporting. I said Energy Star requires NFRC, U-values, and solar heat gain coefficients. Those must re be reported under an NFRC label for any product to be Energy Star rated. Those are the only two out of the NFRC test that Energy Star requires. But if you're testing to NFRC, the labeling requires U-value, the solar heat gain, visible light transmittance, and the air leakage. So looking at that list, 
you can begin to see that the kind of glass that you install in the unit actually makes a huge difference because if they have to report visible light transmittance, plus it'll also affect the overall U value. So when you're looking at these ratings too, it's important to look to see what type of glass was actually tested with the product to know where your project may stand in comparison. It's highly unlikely that you're going to have the exact same product on your project, but it'll give you some basis of comparison. I like the last one, NFRC optional reporting, condensation resistance. The manufacturers need not report this. So even though it carries an NFRC label, condensation may not be reported. And if it's not reported, it may not have been tested. We have a question from listener Bill Burke. Uh, NFRC ratings are required for compliance documentation with California energy codes. Is this also the case with ASHRAE 90.1 and the IECC code? Great question, Bill. And actually, the reference to ASHRAE 90.1 was one of the things that prompted this whole research exercise uh, because what we had heard uh, anecdotally was that ASHRAE 90.1 did require reporting under NFRC. I have checked the 2007, the 2010, and the current 2013 editions. There is no mention in ASHRAE 90.1 of NFRC requirements. I did not check the IECC code, so I don't know if they are requiring it because this, this particular exercise in my, in my case was focused on ASHRAE. Great question. I'll, and I'll have to look into that. I just don't know. So we do have some tools to try to help. AMA actually put together a condensation resistance factor tool. It's an online tool, and what it's going to do is really look at your project design conditions and output a recommended condensation resistance factor based upon your locale and your design conditions. We might point out that's a recommended minimum CRF. Correct. And the attitude from AMA is that if you, if you can get to that recommended minimum, that the likelihood that you're going to have condensation is remote. It doesn't mean that it won't exist. Because I don't know about you, Lewis, but as an architect or a specifier, I really can't control what the building occupants are going to do. No, we're going to talk about that later, okay. but we and we also can't control extreme weather. I mean, I lived in Cincinnati for years and years, and although we would have some minus, you know, between zero and minus ten degrees every every winter, you know, in the 1978 we had some 77, 78 that winter we had some exceptional temperatures that went down to minus 26 degrees air temperature. And with the wind chill factor, of, of course, even high, lower than that. Yeah, but that was very unusual. It's just, you know, freak happenings occur. And if you look at this weather blast that the East Coast has been suffering, this, the temperatures that we've seen have been well below design, uh, outdoor design temperatures. So to try to expect the windows to continue to perform at conditions that are so far below design criteria is really unrealistic. Yeah, what we're looking for is performance over something like 89% of the, of the weather and occasionally it's going, the windows are going to sweat no matter what you do. So this one, I actually found this image in one of the papers that I discovered uh, while doing this research and this comes out of Berkeley, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories. This, these are thermographs of IGU units only. So it's only glass, the edge seals, and the spacers. 
Right, IGU being insulating glass unit. So if you look at the one on the left, in comparison to the one on the right, red is good, purple is bad. And red signifies that you, you're getting very little thermal transmittance through the insulating unit. And the more purple that you see, or the blue range uh, in the colors, the more direct con uh, conductance is going on through the unit. And what this, what this image was trying to show is that the edge design on these two units, everything else being absolutely identical, the edge spacer material created this difference. One of the other things that is interesting about these photographs is you notice, everyone should notice, that there is a significantly more um, warmth leakage at the bottom of the glass than there is at the top. That's because insulating glass units, the size of the airspace has been um, <coughs> decided upon years and years ago as, as being the right uh, width to um, keep the air inside the unit stratified rather than allowing it to circulate with convection. And so the cool air stratifies at the bottom and the warm air, relatively speaking, at the top. And so the sill is in some ways more important than the head and the jams. At least for the glass. For it, with respect, yes, with this, in and respect to this issue. Um, yes. Okay, so looking at the glass and for condensation only, uh, design considerations. We certainly want to look at the framing, the perimeter framing, and the thermal breaks in the framing to make sure that we're not getting direct uh, conductance from interior to exterior. And we want to look at the glass position relative to those thermal breaks so that we're not creating a bridge across the thermal break in the frame. We're wanting to look at controlling the leakage. And I wanted to ask the group this question, and maybe we can get some response. Some years ago, there was a definite, definite pattern to specify manufactured units and curtain wall units with heel bead sealants, you know, so that you're actually setting the glass into a sealant bed uh, against the interior stop. And part of the reason was to help control air leakage, help control water leakage, because now you've built a dam. And in the case that I'm thinking for the uh, condensation resistance, you're also creating now a still air space by sealing the air between the rubber gasket and this heel bead sealant. So with a show of raising hands, if you would, how many of you out there are actually specifying heel bead sealants for your insulating glass units? We'll watch as you, as you raise your hands and we'll report. So the other place that I think that we need to consider is what we're doing with the perimeter between the frame and the surrounding construction because that also can be a bridge, a thermal bridge. Uh, even though it's a sealed space, it could turn into a thermal bridge. The glass performance, we really need to be concerned about the edge of the glass, the glass selection, Lewis mentioned the inner space, the spacer dimension. And that spacer dimension changes with the gas. So most of us are probably specifying air, maybe argon. And that half inch sweet spot for the spacer that we're all accustomed to works very well with both of those. If we go to Krypton, that half inch space is almost double what it needs to be to keep that gas from actually starting to circulate inside the space. We had a question from John Workley, <clears throat> David. Are these tests, the, the, the 
that resulted in those thermographs you showed us in the previous slide, are they done without frames or do these edge designs <coughs> only show the glazing sealant type or condition? What does the yeah. frame design do? <coughs> no, those images were for the glass only. The glass only. They wanted to look at what difference they, they were able to achieve based upon changing the edge, uh, the spacers. Okay, so going back to the heel bead sealants, I only see four hands that are that are specifying heel beads, and oh, there's one more. <laughs> so, if if any of you have um, microphone capability, I'd like to hear from you as to w why you're doing that and what your thinking is. So, if you wanna if you wanna contribute and you can um, <coughs> join us uh, audio. Raise your hand again, and Matt will free you up. And while you're waiting for that, David, uh, Robert Bowman asked to, uh, would you please clarify what the, the heel bead sealant is? Are we, you're not exactly, where is that located in, in the assembly? It would be on the interior pane of glass at the very edge the outside edge of the glass, sealing between the glass and the perimeter frame. Okay, so it's a concealed sealant bead, it's not an exposed bead. Correct. It's inside the glazing pocket. Okay, that's I think what uh, Robert wanted clarified. Uh, Bill Burke says, if you go to Krypton in an IGU, doesn't the manufacturer establish the spacing of the glass? I would only even think of changing the spacing of the glass as an option with most IGU fabricators. Well, the the edge spacers are available in just a whole variety of widths. And really I think what's happened is we're just so accustomed to specifying a half inch spacer and a one inch overall glass with a six millimeter pane that we tend not to think about changing it. But we can't. And the ideal edge um, spacer width is not fixed. It's really set within a range. So that half inch is really like the center of the range for air and argon. And about a quarter of inch is, is where we need to be if we end up at krypton, uh, krypton gas. Um, Wayne Yancey, uh, talking, uh, going back to our he heel bead sealant, says that <clears throat> it's a lot easier to access to install that in curtain wall, but is impractical for the majority of storefront frames. That could be tr well. That could be true, depending upon how it's actually glazed and where the snap-on bead occurs. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Michael Vitti, McVitie asks, how long does Krypton stay in place? We, we all know that argon will leak out you know, in 10 to 15 years and be replaced by regular air. Well, and I'm glad you said that, Lewis, because that's actually changing. Oh. Because argon used to be inserted into the space by drilling a hole through the edge space or filling the space with argon and then plugging the hole. I, I just toured uh, locally here the J.E. Berkowitz fabrication plant. They are no longer putting argon in in that method. So they are not drilling through the spacer, so there is no breach. Uh, they are reporting that it's actually less than a 1% per year loss of argon. Well, that certainly makes it a lot more uh, attractive then, because that uh, the longer lived. Right. That's, that's excellent. How do they uh, how do they get the gas in there? Magic. Magic. <laughs> if they told me that, they'd probably have to shoot me. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, so tell us about spacer materials and warm okay. edge technology. Uh, yes. So here. Oh. Yes. Uh, if you wanted, Larry Norton had raised his hand again. I can unmute his line now if you wanted to ask him directly. Sure, go ahead. All right, so just one second here. I just got to unmute Larry for you in a second. Where'd he go? 
There we go. So Larry, uh, you want to try to make a noise? We'll see if we can hear you. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. Talk louder, Larry. Oh, he just let me know he does not have a microphone. Okay. Okay. Well, we had a couple. Let me get caught up with a couple of uh, comments and questions. Um, <clears throat> John Merlinhoff. Let's see. He says the heel bead is always located in the same place regardless of window type. First of all, the cotton wall is a curtain wall is a non-issue as the wet zone ends at the face of the glazing shoulder, and the frames are not. Uh, we stick in in uh, stick belt configurations. Uh, certain unitized system with advanced draining methodologies do use mullions for drainage. Um, Paul DeArment asks, what is the effect of altitude adjustment on condensation? This is almost universally required here in Colorado. Well, that's a good question. That is a good question. And I don't have an answer for that. And I know that the AMA uh, tool that I mentioned does not account for altitude. That's not one of the input factors. Yeah, we'll have to... Uh, Ask Liz about that and get back with you. Uh, Steve Groff asks, why is it desirable to have air stratified within the IGU? Wouldn't there be more consistent performance across the entire unit if convection was permitted? I think that's because the convection loop would continue and would uh, result in more heat loss over the... Uh, uh, Right, because it's it transferred. It continue to go. It, the yes, tran you would have it more transfers time. the heat from the one pane to the other. Okay. Oh, and uh, we have a follow-up from John Mullenhoff on the heel bead. For window wall, storefront, or vinyl conditions, the heel bead is either instead of or in addition to the foam tape we t typically see. And, and yes, of course, that's that's true. We're not talking about a wet sealed system. We're talking about an additional seal that's inside the uh, the frame. Okay. Uh, and Baker says, as far as argon is there's still an issue with shipping those units to higher altitudes. Of course, that relates to Colorado question. I've always avoided argon due to our altitude. And I assume Ann is from uh, maybe from Colorado or somewhere else. Uh, Richard, Richard DeCampo says, for glass only parameters, can you discuss the impact on condensation of the new low E coatings designed for the number four surface of IGUs. For example, instance, I did some comparison of Pilkington glass and coatings using the LBNL window program for winter conditions. The interior glass surface is 45 degrees with the energy advantage on the number four surface and 54 degrees with it on the number three surface. Although the overall heat loss is slightly less, the condensation potential is increased. I'm not sure if this is a good trade-off. Your thoughts? Wow. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that one, Richard. I, ha I have not myself uh, specified any of the low E coatings on the number four surface yet. Uh, we find ourselves using it on number two or number three, three being preferable, and uh, at least for most of the projects that we're writing, um, and haven't come across the request for a number four surface, so I'm unaware of that. The, the low E coating does dramatically affect the thermal performance of the glass and actually does help improve the edge of glass performance too, so there's a distinct advantage to including low E uh, regardless of what that performance is because it benefits the overall glass. Have you done number four, Lewis? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, and I, ha I haven't either. And that's, um, unfortunately, that's just a little outside what we're trying to cover today, um, except to say that it does make a difference. Uh, the kind of glass, David has already stated, that the kind of glass that we use in the window can affect uh, resistance to condensation. Right. 
So let me just wrap up with these edge spacers, and then I think the next one sends it over to you, Lewis. Okay. Uh, the edge spacers come in stainless steel and aluminum as metal. If, if you do nothing else, you could consider using stainless steel. It's a little bit more costly, but it also has a thinner wall, which means less conductance, and you actually see an improved performance over aluminum just by switching to stainless steel. And, and it is significant. It's not just a, a minor upgrade. It's, right. it's, uh, uh, David and I are going to send you or make available to you some uh, links to some papers on this where you can get into it in as uh, much detail as you like. And they will have some actual numbers comparing uh, these different types. So um, stay tuned, and, and I'm not sure how we'll make those available, but uh, we will uh, pass on the, the fruits of some of our investigations on the Internet. Okay. These are a list of some of the all proprietary warm edge technologies. And I can't say this is an exhaustive list. It's one, it, they are the ones that I know about, that I've been able to find. And I can tell you of all of these, the only one that I've really used so far has been the last one by Technoform. And that has really been by specific request for a specific client for virtually all of the buildings uh, that we specify for them in an attempt to improve the overall performance, especially when they're looking at an entire glass envelope. So there are a number of different types here, and you can see them all. Some of them have metal, some of them don't. And the, the interesting thing that I found in looking at uh, trying to research each one of these is I'm not finding the actual performance data on the manufacturer's websites. It's just not there to be had. It may be available, but they're not publishing it. Um, before we um, uh, go on, uh, let's talk to uh, Sheldon. Sheldon, would you stick your hand up and uh, let Matt get you on board? Um, our friend Sheldon Wolf lives and practices in uh, Minneapolis which some people would think has rather extreme weather. Okay, and, uh, we, we had a follow-up, too, from Bill uh, Burke. He gave us a yes, web yeah, address. Right. <laughs> yeah, and we'll make that available also. Yeah, Matt, if talks you could about capture the, that, that would be yeah. great. But um, I thought it would be interesting just to let folks uh, hear uh, Sheldon's experience in terms of uh, some of these related issues. Uh, first, how common is it for you to uh, specify triple glazed insulating glass instead of uh, the, t the typical dual pane? Sheldon? Hello? Yep, there you are. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, it took a while to cook up there. Um, what was the question again? Okay. Uh, how typical, how often do you specify insulating glass with three panes of glass and two air spaces okay. as opposed to the typical one inch uh, dual, uh, dual glass, double yeah. glass? Well, um, I, I recall a project of about, uh, let's see, what year is this? 30 seven years ago that has triple glazing in it. That's my house. But uh, <laughs> other than that, here at the, at the office, I uh, when I talked to you, was that just yesterday or the day before? It was I yesterday. Thought, yeah, I thought, I thought we might have done a project or two with triple glazing, but I haven't been able to find that. Um, I also did a little quick survey of um, some of the specifiers up in the northern latitudes here. and. Um, of the people who responded there, only one of them said that they had used um, triple glazing on two projects. Otherwise, it appears nobody's doing it. So it's, it's still pretty rare. Yeah. Well, how about the warm edge technology? With yeah, the, that was a little mixed. The special spacers. Yeah, um, that was a little mixed in the same survey. I asked both questions, and um, it's, it's, it seems like it's somewhere in the middle. Um, one, one firm said that they, they do it regularly. Um, we don't uh, unless we're, you know, pushing. <laughs> I think somewhere that contributes to a lead point at some point or other. Um, 
I, I guess I've been unconvinced that it does um, enough to justify the cost because there are so many other things that affect the condensation on the glass that um, uh, you could have it in there and it wouldn't make any difference you know if, if you do other things wrong so so I'm, I'm not sold on it we have we have done it on occasion though. Uh, usually in areas where uh, we have high humidity you, know, you mentioned you did medical work and we do too and and they tend to run things on the humid side so we're we're more likely to use it there than anywhere else okay well thank you for that input Sheldon sure okay so Lewis you might well, as well take over and I'll <laughs> monitor the questions so we're into your Okay. And you only have a short time left, so you better That's hurry. right. Well, we have to hurry. Okay, so as you can see, um, D David has given us a good introduction to some of the, the, the concepts, but uh, there are even the glass position. This is an idea that Sheldon gave me when we were chatting the other day. That is it flush on the outside? Is it a center glazed or interior that that may affect uh, the the exposure and and so forth and most manufacturers probably do not have separate testing for those um, there is there are always new uh, methods of creating that thermal break and some manufacturers are still using the pour into bridge where uh, they pour they <coughs> put a void in the aluminum tubes, fill it with a structural plastic, and then take a router and cut away the aluminum. That's called pour into bridge. Uh, but some, especially curtain wall systems, are using non-metallic uh, struts to hold on the pressure, to hold the pressure plate and non-metallic pressure plates that uh, are supposed to improve performance and then of course we talked about the edge spacer options and then there's always the issue that uh, some of our hot shop designers may want to use those uh, beautiful extended mullion caps that act like heat sinks and they are have probably again not been tested by the manufacturer to see how they affect thermal performance criteria because of course they're all over there I mean you may have some two and a half inch ones and you may have 12 inch ones and just brainstorming the other day, they, uh, I thought, uh, here's some things that once we pick a good product and we decide to put it into our building, um, some other considerations that affect the overall performance. And the most obvious one is being the orientation with regard to sunlight. Uh, that if it's on the north side of the building, uh, you're probably going to have more problem with condensation than if it's on the south side. Uh, the position of the fenestration, is it flush with the wall or is it recessed? Uh, flush buildings may be more subject to uh, the cold air going by and trying to suck the heat out of the building, whereas a recessed window may be a little area of still air and less heat loss. Yeah, but um, Lewis, you left out a different one. Oh, what's that? Projected from the, ah, the yes. building. Yes. <laughs> well, we see more and more of that, and that those tend to lead to more uh, thermal bridging than uh, any yes. other detailing that I see. Because it's, it's all about surface area, isn't it? How yeah. much surface area are you we exposing? Um, anchorage to the uninsulated elements, of course, alignment of the thermal barrier. Uh, you know, it's amazing still that people, when you're developing your wall sections, you need to take a pencil. And can you draw the thermal barrier without lifting the pencil? And uh, keep that in fairly close alignment so that it it doesn't move backwards and forwards too much. Uh, another thing that folks forget is that the drainage cavity in a wall is going to be practically as cold as the outdoors. So uh, our, is the uh, fenestration system exposed to that cold air? 
Uh, some projects may have heavy sills or panning that act as thermal bridges, again, to, to lose heat. And um, air infiltration, uh, we talked about, is a, something that affects the, the um, condensation. Uninsulated shim spaces, uninsulated corner trim, where we uh, have a big six by six inch box to turn the corner with curtain wall and it's uh, uh, just a piece of metal and there's no insulation in there. Location of the exterior sealant bead um, may expose again more metal to ex exterior and of course the interior design humidity which we talked about. Right. Let's go, let's go to the next. Oh your favorite. This is my favorite. Uh, fortunately it's not from my firm <laughs> but the I did uh, a couple of peer review projects, and uh, this is from a nationally known architectural firm. We won't, which we will protect the innocent by leaving them nameless. But you can see that the uh, curtain wall there is attached to a precast eyebrow element that is a wonderful heat sink, and so the warm side of the curtain wall is outside of the insulation. Which, uh, uh, which means that if there's a thermal break in that system, it's basically negated and they've wasted their money. You mean right there? Right there. Okay. And, uh, and of course, it's even got a big piece of metal that the, uh, the building is concrete framed and you have this heavy metal mounting for the precast and boy, once that gets cold, it's going to stay cold for a while. Let's go to the next one. Sure. Uh, this one is for Dow, was a project that's under construction in Dallas, Texas. And again, we have a precast and the precast has a little metal tube embedded in it specifically for anchoring the curtain wall. And again, we're attaching the warm side of the curtain wall to the cold side of the exterior enclosure. Right, and this is one of the things that I mentioned that depending upon how you anchor your framing system, you can easily create short circuits. Yes, that's because those are all <clears throat> metal pieces, or, and even the shims, if they're not metal, they're high-density plastic, and they're, they're probably leaking. And then also, the, point to that air space behind the seal. Here. Inside the exterior sealant. That exterior sealant does not have much insulative value, so that air space is basically cold, even if, it, even if the curtain wall were attached to behind the wall insulation, that space would still be cold because the, the, uh, the seal and the backer rod are not providing any significant insulative value. Not to mention this great heat sink right up here cooling that space. Uh, yes, I love that. Yes. <laughs> this is wonderful. But you could actually, if, I'm sorry, go back one. Go I back? Actually, okay. All right and point to where the uh, where the uh, the thermal brakes are in the system they're right out there where the decorative cap snaps on here those are yeah. the thermal brakes yeah no really and that's typical you know the because structurally the the glazing pocket has to be strong enough to hold this heavy glass, so it's going to be aluminum. And you can see that those snap-on um, caps, and this was modeled directly from the proprietary system they were going to use, have little plastic inserts to insulate the snap-on cap from the main frame. That'll work. <laughs> We're okay. Not, let's go to the next one. All right. <clears throat> now this one is, uh, of course, a very simple, uh, less complex thing. And again, we're attaching to this huge pieces of precast that are going to get cold and stay cold during the winter. And notice also that 
in addition to condensation on the window, we're going to have condensation on the back side of that precast in right here. Well, uh, down further. Down Behind, further? Between, on the back side of that precast. Mm -hmm. So we've got water there where the stud cavity is. Oh, and can, and okay, can attack, in here. And can attack that gypsum board and perhaps grow mold in there. Yes, okay. That's why we invented <laughs> continuous insulation. Okay, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> now here we've uh, put a window into a brick wall and <clears throat> you have the steel stud that is, is supporting a steel tube for anchoring the system and uh, again we have <clears throat> the system attached to the steel stud that's attached to the, the uh, or I'm so sorry, to that hollow steel tube, but it's all very close. There's no real thermal break between that masonry right. sill and that steel tube. A little bit of air, but none. But I think in actual practice, that's probably going to be filled up with mortar or it's going to be no gap at all. And the other thing in this one is that, again, as I mentioned before, that drainage cavity in there is going to be cold. So if it's zero degrees outside, that drainage cavity is only going to be a few degrees higher because the, the brick is not, doesn't have any significant uh, insulative value. Well, and this path right through here, right through there, there is no thermal resistance anywhere. No, there's no, yeah, the insulation is discontinuous. So, uh, again, if we t take the, uh, the not lift the pencil uh, test, it fails. And yep. that also means that, depending upon what they're using for a stool there, uh, that if that's wood, that's going to definitely be affected. Now, this one is interesting because on the bottom, at the sill, um, we've got a pretty good situation. The uh, system is anchored to the warm side of the wall yeah. and there is insulation in there. Um, the wood blocking it forms somewhat of a blockage from the cold air in the, in the uh, drainage cavity depending upon how tightly everything fits together. But if we look at the top we see that there is a huge shelf angle that is holding up the exterior masonry and that that is welded to a channel frame that is actually holding up the shelf angle. So this is one massive heat sink that is going to get cold and stay cold and now we're anchoring the top of our window to uh, this big, large piece of steel. Lewis, please tell me that they corrected some of these details. Um, some of them, <laughs> yes. As I say, um, they're not all mine. Now, these are some uh, that are a little better. Now, here we've got a window. Uh, and it's attached to the warm side of the wall. You notice the continuous insulation is going up. We do have some heavy panning, which c might affect things. Notice also there is a bit of a gap between the back side of the metal framing and whatever that stool is, which I think is a, I think it's solid surfacing material. And that's helpful because if that was wood, uh, <clears throat> having a little gap there that you fill with uh, caulking would uh, provide some protection that if you do get some condensation it would help. But uh, overall there's been a pretty good approach here that we're attaching to the warm side of the wall. But that all that panning could possibly affect the, uh, the overall performance. Uh, fortunately this building is in Birmingham and uh, so most years it's probably not going to be a problem. Let's go to the next okay. one. Um, Joseph Anatrella points out that uh, 
sill flashing can be a heat sink. And um, yes, that's true. And it depends upon whether your sill is an extruded sill that's got more mass or if it's a little piece of skinny sheet metal. And does that sill go all the way under the, uh, the sill flashing or sill uh, subsill? Does it go all the way under the sill tube so that, again, we're attaching the sill tube through or to something that is going to be cold on the outside? Or is it, in the case of curtain wall, is it uh, just a short sill that goes into the glazing pocket and probably doesn't affect the anchorage? Uh, here we have installation in a wall that's got ACM cladding. And again, we're anchoring to uh, the insulated side. We have continuous insulation which it would be nice if it turned back up, but that may not have been completely practical. So that one's a reasonably well detailed, I think. OK. How about the next one? And here we have a head situation. Uh, this is for a building uh, up in Michigan. And this one is a little more problematic just because we've got a fair amount of the aluminum tube in the curtain wall that's exposed to the cold air. And even though we have uh, continuous insulation, all of a sudden we do have this little break and that gap around the curtain wall is going to be cold. Right here. Now one, one solution, and although it's being attached to uh, a hollow tube, a steel tube, uh, that is insulated, or at least partly insulated. Now, one thing that we have done on a lot of our projects is to fill those shim spaces with spray polyurethane foam. Especially if you think about a storefront where that has an open throat, you can fill that whole void, and not only does it uh, give you a, a better thermal value and a thermal break, but it uh, it also uh, completes the air barrier, uh, and it's also a secondary uh, water barrier because it's closed cell foam. Right. Uh, and jo and Joe Joe Anatrella reminds us, low rise only for the foam. <laughs> right, right, because we get into trouble with the NFPA 285 testing if we go too high. Well, and the pressure, and the pressure. On, the, on the framing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do we, is there another one I forget? Ah, I think yes. there are a couple more, and we're, okay. we're a little past the hour. And okay. Well, why don't we skip that, and let's just go to the, the, go to the bottom one with the, uh, the square tube. This the next one? one. No, the next one. Okay, here's where I talked about, uh, here's an example where that corner trim was in fact insulated rather than being uninsulated. But if you can just imagine if it was not insulated, I'm not sure how they got that insulation in there by the way, in terms of constructability. But if it was just an open void, it would, for one thing, it would leak air into it from the outside. There's no way that you're going to make that air tight. And it would be cold, and it would be affecting the performance of, of the system. But. But? There's always a but. There are always trade-offs. We can do the, buy the best product. We can install it correctly. And then our owner closes the drapes or the shades, creates a, uh, minor humidity chamber prevents air that would otherwise dry out, dry off the condensation, and allows it to accumulate. We have freak temperatures. We have excessive wind velocity. The owner uh, operates the HVAC at a level that other than what it was designed to. He has and a pipe break. Say again? He has a pipe break. And doesn't <laughs> yes. clean it up. And of course, we've all been in buildings. I, I know I have 
plenty of buildings with storefront type windows with a sealed a sealant on the inside and sealant on the outside and that's the only thing and you walk by the window and you can see daylight <laughs> through the jams. And I, I only mentioned pipe break because we had a photo in this morning's paper of the Tropicana Casino uh, high rise hotel here in Atlantic City that had a pipe break. Now I'm not sure where this pipe break happened but on about the 30th floor the photo was from the exterior and we had ice cascading down the facade <laughs> of the building. Oh man. Scary thought. Well, we've gone a little over uh, time folks and we appreciate your patience. I see that most of you have stayed with us and we certainly uh, uh, appreciate that and I, I, we hope that this is giving you some good food for thought. Uh, David and I are going to make arrangements with Matt to make available some uh, links to uh, some of these uh, research papers that we have found that may be of interest to you. Okay, good. Thank you very much.